important product of his creative brain. Its ultimate purpose is the complete mastery of mind over the material world, the harnessing of the forces of nature to human needs. This is the difficult task of the inventor who is often misunderstood and unrewarded. But he finds ample compensation in the pleasing exercises of his powers and in the knowledge of being one of that exceptionally privileged class without whom the race would have long ago perished in the bitter struggle against the pitiless elements. Well, good afternoon and welcome, Elon. Oh, I was going to take off my tie. Is that right. all right if I do that? Uh, I, I came in with a tie, but then I was like told there was a good tie, so. Uh, <laughs> then we'll both be more comfortable. Sounds good. Um, well, thanks, well, for, thanks no, for having me. Appreciate your, your being here today. I, you know, it's, when I'm with you, it's difficult to know where to start. Um, let's start just what drives you. What, what is it that when you wake up in the morning, do you see a problem and you want to solve it? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the, the thing that uh, drives me is that uh, I want to be able to think about the future and uh, you know, feel good about that. Um, so uh, that uh, you know, we're doing what we can to uh, have the future be, be as good as possible. Um, to be inspired by what is likely to happen, um, and to look forward to the next day. Um, so that's that's what really really drives me is is, is trying to figure out uh, how do we how to make sure that things are great and um, and going to be so. And um, that's the underlying principle behind uh, Tesla and SpaceX um, is that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty important that we accelerate the transition to uh, sustainable generation and consumption of energy. Um, it, it's inevitable, but it's, it matters if, we ha if it happens sooner or, or later. Um, and then SpaceX is about um, helping make life multiplanetary um, and doing what we can to continue the, the dream of Apollo um, and uh, ultimately make a contribution to life becoming multi-planetary. Well, let's talk a little more about that. I think uh, everyone very interested in that when you say making life multi-planetary. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so what's I your mean, vision there? You know, um, I think, you know, particularly for uh, Americans, you know, like think about America is a nation of explorers. Uh, people came here from other parts of the world that, you know, uh, chose to give up the known in favor of the unknown. Um, so I think uh, exploration, like <clears throat> I think the United States is a, is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Um, and uh, so that's why it, it appeals to Americans so much. You know, um, you can see this when, say there was a shuttle tragedy um, and seven people died. And that's, that's terrible, but you know, a lot of people die all the time. Um, but, but why do we care so much? Because it was the dream of exploration that was dying uh, along with those people. That's why. No, and I'm one of those, and I'm probably like many of you, remember exactly where you were uh, when that, that tragedy happened. So you have 30 plus governors here today, and we're very excited about uh, your willingness uh, to be with us. 
and you hopefully heard me talk a little bit about uh, my initiative, which is being ahead of the curve. What do you tell us as governors? What, we, what should we be thinking about in terms of, of innovation and, and developing public policy for the future? Well, um, it, it sure is important to get the, the rules right. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, in, in terms of legislative and executive actions, um, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, think of, say, like professional sports or something. If you, if you don't have the rules right, if there isn't, uh, uh, you know, um, if, it, if, it, if, it, if, the, if the game isn't set up properly, it's not going to be a, a good game. Um, so it's real important to get the, rule, the rules right. Um, now, I think it's, it's worth noting that I think still um, in the United States, the rules are still better than anywhere else. Um, um, but um, the, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to put something in place which is an inhibitor to, to innovation without realizing it. Um, so, in terms of um, the regulatory environment, uh, uh, it's, it's always important to bear in mind that uh, regulations uh, are immortal, um, and they, 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 they never die unless somebody act, actually goes and kills them, and then they, they get a lot of momentum. So, a lot of times regulations can be put in place for, for all the right reasons, um, but then nobody goes back and gets rid of them afterwards when they no longer make sense. Um, you know, the, uh, and there used to be a rule in the early days when people were concerned about automobiles because that was a pretty scary thing, see a carriage just going wrong by itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know what those things might do. Um, so there were like rules where you had to, in a lot of states, we had to carry a lantern in front of the automobile. <laughs> um, and it had to be like 100 paces ahead of the automobile. There had to be someone with a lantern on a pole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. But you really get rid of that regulation, and they did, you know, because um, <laughs> it would really be awkward. Um, so, um, so just re regulations, even if done correctly and for and, and being right at the time, it's always important to go back and and scrub those, you know, periodically to make sure they're still sensible and they're still serving the greater good. Um, I think uh, in, in terms of tax structure, to, to what what is what is economically incented and what is, what is not economically incented. Just make sure that the incentive structure is, is correct. I, don't, I think I'm saying just totally common sense things here. Um, but um, it's economics 101. Whatever you, whatever you incent will happen. Um, so the, if you incent one thing, that thing will tend to happen more than the other thing. If you incent another thing, that, that thing will happen. Um, and so the the economics should favor innovation. Um, and, um, and this is particularly important to uh, protect uh, small to medium-sized companies um, because, because it's sort of like trying to grow a tree in a forest. Like it's real hard for a new company to, to grow. Um, when it's just a seedling or a sapling, uh, it needs a lot more protection um, than if it's a giant redwood or something like that. So. Uh, very, very important to uh, give support to small and uh, small to medium-sized companies on the innovation front, um, and um, they're the ones that, that need it more than the big companies. And I, I think this point tells us almost big company, biggish company anyway. Um, so I'd favor, you know, supporting uh, smaller companies than Tesla, uh, relatively speaking. What would your response be? Because there are critics out there with regard to incentives, mm -hmm. and that, sure. and you know, Tesla has been, and I can speak from experience, uh, the the beneficiary of of incentives, economic mm -hmm. incentives, when with regard to the to the Gigafactory. Sure. What would yeah. you tell those those people? Yeah, I think. Well, first of all, as you know, the, the those incentives were um, a little overstated. Um, the, um, the, the, in the case of the Gigafactory, it's a, it's a $5 billion investment, capital investment, to get that uh, factory going. Um, and I, I didn't actually know this until, by the way, by the way I, didn't, I didn't know this until we did the press conference. Actually, that, that, that over 20 years, the Nevada incentives added up to $1.3 billion. I actually didn't even know this. 
but, but, but it's now a, he's telling me. <laughs> Go ahead. Literally, yeah. I learned it at the press conference. I'm like, really? Um, no, but I mean, it's the, 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 the thing is that they, they took what, what added up over 20 years and made it sound like Nevada was writing us a $1.3 billion check. And I'm, you know, I'm still waiting for that check. Uh, it's, <laughs> did it get lost in the mail? I don't know. Um, so, uh, but you know, this is the way the press works, of course. Um, so, it, if, now if you divide 1.3 billion by 20, okay, then it's, it, it's like, okay, Tesla's on average um, rece receives a, 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 a sort of a, a tax, it, it, well, d d d doesn't, it, it's, it's right, basically sales and use tax abatement is, is what it amounts to. Um, so t Tesla gets like on the order, we get on the order of 50, to 60 million of sales and use tax abatement divided over 20 years. Um, and, uh, but, but this is for something which has a $5 billion capital cost uh, just to get going, and then um, would have to generate about $100 billion over that period of time to, to achieve a $1.3 billion uh, tax benefit. So, um, so essentially, it's, it's a little over 1% over that period of time, and that's great, okay? But uh, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not like, it's, it's not the way it was characterized in the press. Um, it, but if, if, because if it's put in the proper context, it sounds like, okay, well, that's neat, you know. It's about 5% 5, 5 helpful on setting up the factory and about 1% helpful over the next 20 years. <laughs> cool. That actually sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so, so that, 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 was, that was helpful, but there are a lot of other factors as well. Um, and uh, we actually had slightly bigger incentive packages from, from some other states that were offered, uh, but we factored in um, how quickly could we uh, uh, get the Gigafactory into operation, um, what were the risks associated with uh, that progress, um, uh, what would the over what would be the logistics costs over time of transferring battery packs and powertrains to a, a vehicle factory in uh, California, um, and uh, you know and, and all of those factors weighed together um, is what made, uh, is what um, led us to make the decision in favor of Nevada, um, and and working with 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 your team was great. I was very forward leaning. Um, and, um, and like a, a big part was also just like making you know sure you feel really welcome, you know, uh, within within the state. Um, so um, that's sort of what what led us to make the decision for the Gigafactory. Um, and then um, then we have another factory in in, in New York doing uh, solar panels. Um, also, actually, it's will be the biggest solar. Uh, panel producer in North America when it's done, um, and then we expect us to establish probably at least uh, two or three more uh, gigafactories in the U.S. in the next several years, um, as well as uh, what, a couple overseas. Um, but the overall objective of Tesla it, it's, is, is really what, what set of actions can we take to accelerate the advent of sustainable production and consumption of energy? Um, and um, I, I think the, the, the sort of the way, the way I would assess the historic good of Tesla is in terms of, of, how, of what that, how many years of acceleration was it? You know, and if we can accelerate sustainable energy by 10 years, I would consider that to be a great success. Hope, even if it was only five years, that would still be pretty good. Um, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the overarching optimization. So you, you've talked about interplanetary travel and sustainable energy and the vehicles a little bit. What, what would you want things to look like in five to ten years associated with, with energy sure. and with autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles? Hmm. Well, I think things are going to be... They're going to grow exponentially. So there's a big difference between five and ten years. Um, you know, my my guess is, uh, yeah, probably in ten years, more than a half of uh, new vehicle 
um, production is electric in the United States. Um, and China's probably going to be ahead of that because China's been super pro EV. Um, I don't think a lot of people know this, but like, I mean, China's environmental policies are way ahead of the US. Like their mandate for renewable energy far exceeds the US. I think this, sometimes people are under the impression that China is uh, either dragging their feet or, or somehow behind the US in terms of um, sustainable energy promotion, but they're, they're by far the most aggressive on Earth. It's crazy. I mean, like, in fact, the a, a coalition of Chinese car manufacturers just wrote the Chinese government to beg for them to slow down the mandate. Hmm. Because it's like too much. They, they need to make 8% electric vehicles, I think, like next year or in two years or something. There's like, they can't physically do it. Um, so China's by far the most aggressive on um, electric vehicles and solar. Um, so, um, but that's a common misperception that they're not. Um, there's one Google search way to figure this out, by the way. It's really pretty straight, pretty easy. So, and in ten, in ten, yeah, ten years, man. I think, yeah, yeah. So ha half of all production, I think, will be, be EV. I think almost all cars produced will be autonomous in ten years. Almost all. It will be rare to find one that is not in ten years. Um, that's going to be a huge transformation. Um, now, the thing to bear in mind, though, is that. New vehicle production is only about 5% the size of the vehicle fleet. So you think about how long does a car or truck last? And they last 15 to 20 years so before they're finally scrapped. So new vehicle production is only roughly one, at, at most 1 15th of the, the fleet size. So even when new vehicle production, say, switches over, switches over to electric or to autonomous, that still means the vast majority of the fleet on the roads is not. It'll take another, you know, five to ten years before that becomes majority. The majority of the fleet becomes EV or uh, uh, autonomous. Um, but if you were to say go out twenty years, overwhelmingly, things are electric, autonomous, overwhelmingly. Fully autonomous. Fully autonomous. So no one will have to touch the steering wheel if there is one. There will not be a steering wheel. <laughs> in 20 years, um, it will be like having a horse. People have horses, which is cool. Um, but so, so having a regular car will be like having a horse. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And there will be people that have that have, you know, non-autonomous cars, like people have horses. <laughs> <laughs> it just would be unusual to use that as a mode of transport. Yes, all right. Now, let's talk about um, the energy piece and rooftop solar and storage. Um, yeah. Um, so the. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's <clears throat> important to appreciate that the Earth is almost entirely solar powered today, um, in the sense that the sun is the only thing that keeps us from. Um, being at roughly the temperature of cosmic background radiation, which is three degrees above absolute zero. If it wasn't for a sun, we'd be a frozen dark uh, ice bowl. Um, and the, uh, the, amount of, so the amount of energy that, hits the sun, that reaches us from the sun is tremendous. It's 99% it's 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 plus of all energy that, that Earth has. Um, then there's, 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 there's this energy we need to used to run civilization, which to us is big, but compared to the amount of energy that reaches us from the sun is tiny. Um, so it, it, it's very easy, like it actually doesn't take much. If, if, you, if you wanted to power the entire United States with solar panels, um, it would take um, a, a fairly small corner of Nevada, Texas, Utah, anywhere. Uh, look, you, it's, it, you only need about 100 miles by 100 miles of solar panels to power the entire United States. Um, and then the, the batteries you need to store that energy to make sure you have 24-7 um, uh, power is uh, one mile by one mile, the one, one square mile. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I showed the graph of the, or, or image of this where 
Uh, this is what 100 miles by 100 miles looks like. It's like you know, a little square on the US map. Um, and then one, there's a little pixel inside there, and that's the size of the battery pack that you need to support that. Real tiny. So, Will, you, you talked about 20 years from now, none of us, well, some people will still be using horses or... or it won't be zero. Yeah. But it's so, too rare. So what will the, the energy piece look like? I mean, what, will there be transmission lines? Will there mm -hmm. be a need? Yeah, I think the... So there's... The, it, it, use of energy can, is roughly divided into three areas. Um, and they're more or less equal um, at, a, at a high level. Um, there's about a third of energy is used for transportation of various kinds. About a third is used uh, for electricity. About a third is used for heating. So if you want to have, uh, and, and then of, of, of the electricity production, call it you know, something on the order of 10%, depending upon how you count it, is renewable. Maybe 15% um, uh, today. So th that means that there's a massive amount of solar that would need, need to be produced um, and connected in order to to be fully sustainable, because fully sustainable means you're tackling transport, um, non-renewable electricity generation, and heating. Um, so that, that means there will need to be a combination of utility scale solar and rooftop scale solar, combined with uh, wind, geothermal, uh, hydro, probably some, some nuclear for a while, um, in order to transition to a sustainable uh, situation. Um, which means, really, for the most part, massive, massive growth in solar. Um, and it's, it's going to be important to have rooftop solar in uh, neighborhoods um, because otherwise you're gonna, there'll need to be uh, massive new transmission lines built. And people do not like having transmission lines go through the neighborhood. They really don't like that. And I agree. <laughs> so um, so you, you want to have some localized energy uh, production um, combined with utility, it's, so you want rooftop solar, utility solar, um, and uh, that, that's, that's really going to be the solution from a physics standpoint, that I can't see any other way to really do it. Um, um, people talk a lot about fusion and all that, but the, the sun is a giant fusion reactor in the sky, and it's really reliable. It comes up every day. Um, <laughs> so if it doesn't, we've got bigger problems. <laughs> uh, somebody asked me to ask you this. We, we talked about workforce today, but they asked me, are robots going to take our jobs, everybody's jobs in the future? Or how, how, how much do you see artificial do. intelligence coming into the, the workplace? Um, well, first of all, I, I think on the artificial intelligence front, um, you know, I, I have exposure to the very, the very most cutting edge um, AI. Um, uh, and I think people should be really concerned about it. Um, I keep so sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like, they don't know how to react, because you know, it seems so ethereal. Um, and um, I think we should be really concerned about AI, and I think we should yeah, this is, AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive. Um, because I think by the time we are reactive in AI regulation, it's too late. Um, and no, normally the way regulations are set up is that a whole bunch of bad things happen, there's a public outcry, the, the, and then after many years, a regulatory agency is set up to regulate that industry. Um, and there's a bunch of opposition from companies who don't like being told what to do by regulators. Um, anyway, it takes forever. Um, that, that, in the past, ha has been bad, but not um, something which represented a, uh, you know, a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. AI is a fundamental risk to the existence of human civilization. Um, in a way that car accidents, uh, airplane crashes, um, faulty drugs, uh, 
or bad food were, were not. They were, not they, they were harmful to, to uh, a set of individuals within society, of course, but they were not harmful to society as a whole. Um, AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization, and I don't think people fully appreciate that. Um, you know, it's not, it's not fun being regulated. It's not, you know, uh, it can be pretty irksome, but, uh, you know, in the car business, we, you know, we get regulated uh, by Department of Transport, by EPA, and a bunch of others. Um, and, and there's regulatory agencies in every, every country. You know, in, the, in space, uh, we get regulated by FAA. Um, and, um, but, but, you know, if you ask the average person, hey, you wanna, do you want to get rid of the FAA? Um, and just like take a, take a chance on manufacturers not cutting corners on the aircraft because uh, you know profits were down that quarter. Uh, I was like, eh, hell no. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> so um, you know, I think even people who are pretty you know, extremely like libertarian free market, they'd be like, yeah, we should probably have somebody keeping an eye on the aircraft companies, making sure they build a good aircraft. Um, and good cars and that kind of thing. So, you know, I think there's, there's a role for regulators. Um, that's very important. Um, and I'm against overregulation for sure. Uh, but, man, we've, I think we better get on that with AI, Prano. Um, and uh, so, so there'll certainly be a lot of job disruption. Um, because what's going to happen is robots will be able to do everything better than us. I'm, inclu I'm including, I mean, all of us, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what to do about this. <laughs> um, it's like the, it's the, like, it, this is really like the scariest problem to me, I'll tell you. Um, and um, yeah, so. I really think we need government regulation here, just to, because this is, you know, ensuring the public good is served. Because you've got companies that are racing, that they kind of have to race to build AI, or they're going to be uh, made uncompetitive. You know, like the, essentially, if your competitor is racing to build AI and you don't, they will crush you. So then you're like, ah, we don't want to be crushed. So, uh, you know, I guess we need to build it too. Um, that's where you need the regulators to come in and say, hey guys, um, you all need to really, you know, just pause and make sure this is safe. And like when, when it's cool and, we're and the regulators are convinced that it's safe to proceed, then you can go. But otherwise, slow down. Um, and, but, long, but you kind of need the regulators to do that for, for all the teams in the game. You know, uh, otherwise the shareholders will be saying like, hey, why aren't you developing AI? faster um, because your competitor is. I'm like, uh, okay, we better do that. Um, anyway, so it's like, I mean, there's like something like 12% of jobs are transport. Transport will be one of the first things to go fully autonomous. But when I say everything, like the robots will be able to do everything, bar, bar nothing. Let's move back to your rolling out the Model 3 this year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how many orders, what, did, what is that going to look like? Um, yeah, it's going well on that front. Um, we got, uh, I don't know, more, I think like if somebody orders a Model 3 today, they'd only get it probably late next year. Um, we just actually just started production, we made the first production unit last week. Um, and. Uh, the thing that is, is not well appreciated about um, something about, about cars and any kind of new technology is how hard it is to do the manufacturing. It is vastly harder to do the manufacturing by a factor of a hundred, like a hundred, than to, to make the to make that car to make one of something. Like, with with maybe fifty or sixty people, we could make a prototype of practically anything in six months. Um, now to manufacture that thing, we need 5,000 people to spend, you know, three years, and that's considered really fast. So, uh, manufacturing will, does this kind of S curve where it's excruciatingly slow at first, and then it, it grows exponentially, 
Um, and then, uh, but people tend to extrapolate on a straight line. So if it's real slow at first, they say, oh, it was real slow, look at that. They're only going to make five cars a week forever. Like, nope. Uh, it'll be 10 cars a week, then 20 cars a week, then, you know, 40 cars a week, then 5,000 cars a week eventually. Um, it just grows crazy fast. Uh, so we're hoping to get to, you know, something, uh, you know, like 5,000 cars a week by the end of the year. Well, um, I wanted to give an opportunity for some of the governors to ask questions and perhaps some audience questions. Um, I, I was told that you'd be willing to, yeah, to do absolutely. that. Great. So, uh, governors, any questions for, for Elon? Governor Scott. Well, thank you very much. Um, we in Vermont have uh, partnered with Tesla in, uh, in terms of a power pack in, in our homes, and it's yeah. for $15 a day. Uh, you can rent this for 15 years, and it'll, it'll carry power as a backup generation device for 12 hours, and it's been really, really interesting from my perspective. Uh, but I'm curious about vehicles and, and where we're going in the future, uh, or how far in the future do the cars themselves become uh, the charging device, like the, the roof and deck lids and, and uh, hood, or, does, or do the batteries get so efficient that you don't need that, and then you just power up for a week or something like that? Where are we going in the future? with battery storage? Yeah, I think the future is, it's, there's just there's three legs to the stool. Uh, there's uh, electric cars, there's a stationary battery pack, um, and solar power. Uh, with those three things, you can have a completely sustainable energy future. Uh, that's, all, that's all that's needed. On the, sol on the solar front, like I said, uh, it's going to be a combination of rooftop solar and utility scale solar. Um, you'll need both because of the you know, enormous demand for electricity. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the things that's, that's been missing, I think, up till now is having rooftop solar that looks good um, and isn't, an, uh, you know, um, that, that's where we've got this, the solar glass roof that we're developing. Um, and we're doing it in different styles so that it, it, you know, it matches the aesthetics of a, of a particular house or um, so regional style. Um, that's, I think that's actually pretty important. Um, and... Um, the conventional flat panel solars will, 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 for, for flat roofs and for commercial will be uh, the, way, the way to go. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and, and putting solar panels on the, on the car itself, not that, uh, not that helpful because the actual surface area of the car is not, not very much and cars are very often indoors. Um, and so it's the least efficient place to put solar is on the car. Just wondering about maybe a wrap of some sort, is that, is that make any sense in the future, like a, a wrap of solar around either a building made of a solar panel or a wrap of a, of a vehicle actually being the solar panel but being the, the components of the vehicle itself? I, I don't think so. Um, I'll scrap that idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, just, uh, it's just way better to put it on a roof, uh, for sure. Um, I, I, I really thought about this. I mean, really, and I pushed my team about, like, isn't there some way we could do it on the car? Um, I mean, the, the, technically, if you have, like, some sort of transformer-like thing which will pop out of the trunk like, like a, a, you know, like a hard-top convertible and just, like, ch -ch -ch, like, ratchet solar panels over the whole surface area of the car, extending, like, for the entire, say, uh, square footage of a parking space, um, provided you're in the sun, uh, that would be enough to generate about 20 to 30 miles a day of electricity, but uh, that is for sure the expensive, difficult way to do it. <laughs> right. Governor Burgum. Still thought about it. Maybe we should. But. Elon, thank, thanks for being here. Uh, with your background in payment systems, uh, you understand uh, the important role of uh, security and transactions. Uh, yeah. Now that you've got... I, I think security is a cyber security. Yes, and, you're in, in, a, in, a, in the vehicles you're building now are incredibly complex software systems. I mean, the car is really yep. a rolling piece of software. It is. It's like a laptop on wheels. Yes. So uh, share with us a little bit about uh, your thoughts on cybersecurity and how, you, how, you, how, how we protect. Uh, you talk about protecting society when uh, yep. you've got a rolling fleet of... Um, I, I think one of the biggest uh, risks for autonomous vehicles is somebody achieving um, a fleet-wide hack. Um, you know, in principle, if, if somebody was able to hack, say, all of the autonomous Teslas, they could say, 
I mean, just as a prank, they could say, like, send them all to Rhode Island <laughs> from across the United States. <laughs> and they'd be like, well, okay, that would be the end of Tesla. <laughs> um, and <laughs> there'd be a lot of angry people in Rhode Island, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so uh, we've got to make super sure that, uh, that a, a fleet-wide hack is basically impossible and that if people are in the car, that they have uh, override authority on uh, whatever the car is doing. So if the car is doing something wacky, uh, you can press a button that no amount of software can override that will ensure that the, uh, you, you, you gain control of the vehicle um, and cut, cut, cut the link to the servers. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty fundamental. Um, within the car, we actually have, even, even if somebody gains access to the car, there are multiple subsystems within the car that, that, that also have uh, specialized encryption. So the powertrain, for example, has specialized encryption. So even if somebody would gain access to the car, they cannot gain access to the powertrain or to the braking system. Um, and, um, but it is my top, top concern from a security standpoint at Tesla is making sure that fleet-wide hack or any vehicle-specific hack can occur. The, 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 they have the same problem with cell phones. Um, you know, uh, if we're, it's, it's kind of crazy today that we live quite uh, comfortably in, in, a, in a world that George Orwell would have thought was super crazy. Um, like, we, we, we all carry... Um, a phone with a, with, with a microphone that can be turned on really at any time without our knowledge with a GPS that knows our position um, and a camera um, and uh, well kind of all of our personal information. Um, we do this um, willingly um, and uh, it's kind of wild to think that that's the case. Um, so so pho the, the phone like Apple and and uh, Google kind of have the same challenge of making sure there cannot be a fleet-wide hack or, or a system-wide hack of phones um, or, or a specific hack. So that, that's our top, our top concern. Um, yeah, it become a, it's going to become a bigger and bigger concern. It, I think Tesla's, um, I don't want to have fate here, but Tesla's, Tesla's pretty good at software compared to the other car companies. Um, and um, so I do think it's going to be a bit, like an even bigger challenge for, for the other car companies to ensure security. Yeah. Thank you. Governor Dugard. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Mr. Musk, thank you for speaking to all the governors today. It's, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, one question I had, uh, we saw when gasoline prices went to three and a half dollars a gallon, there was a big jump in interest in hybrid vehicles, sure. and, and uh, you saw those vehicles become very much in demand, and then as gasoline prices have fallen, you've seen a reversal of that. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, you have a concern about the future of electric vehicles in the face of those very low prices. Can you speak to that? Well, the, the economics, um, uh, they, they, they kind of set, set the slope of the, the, the curve. Um, so there's no question in my mind whatsoever that all transport, with the ironic exception of rockets, will go fully electric. Um, everything. Um, planes, trains, automobiles. Well, tra a lot of trains are already electric. Um, all, all ships. Um, and, um, it's, but it's a question of what that time frame is. And the economic uh, incentive structure drives that time frame. Um, that's really what it amounts to. Um, you know, there's, there's the, 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 and the big challenge is that there's an unpriced externality in the cost of fossil fuels. Uh, so the un unpriced externality is the, uh, the, the probably weighted uh, harm that, of changing the chemical constituency of the uh, atmosphere and oceans. Um, it, it, it's, since it is not captured in the price of gasoline, um, it does not uh, drive the right behavior. Um, you know, it would be like uh, if tossing out garbage was just free and 
you know, there was no penalty. You just do as much as you want. And like, streets would be full of garbage. Um, so, um, and we, we regulated a lot of other things like sulfur emissions and nitrous oxide emissions and that kind of thing. It's done, done a lot of good on that front. Um, with CO2, it's tough because there's so many vested interests on the sort of fossil fuel side. Um, and sometimes I think I feel like those guys feel like kind of hard done by because, uh, um, you know, it wasn't obvious like when they were creating their oil and gas companies that it would be bad for the environment. Um, and they worked really hard to create those companies. And then they feel like, well, now they're being kind of attacked on moral grounds. Um, when they didn't originally start those oil companies or, or, or build them up on, on bad moral grounds. Um, and, and, and it is true that we cannot instantaneously change to a sustainable situation. Um, but then those guys will also fight pretty hard to slow down the change. And that's really what I think is morally wrong. Governor Bevin and then De Governor Hutchinson. Then we'll take a couple, oh, and then Governor Hickenlooper, and then we'll take some audience questions. Governor Bevin. Elon, Elon, thank you for being here. Uh, short version of the question, then slightly longer. The short version is, do you ever feel pressure by others' expectations of you and your endeavors in light of the progress you've made thus far, is the short version. And, and, and more specifically, when you look just at Tesla alone, and you look at a company with a $54 billion valuation, uh, right. And seemingly by typical market, market metrics, no justifiable reason for that. What are you saying? Does, I'm just saying, I'm <laughs> Sir. curious. Sir. I'm just, in all seriousness, do you feel a, a, a concern ever that your intellect and your intellectual curiosity and your ingenuity cannot be matched by those that are trying to commercialize it? Does that ever affect how you think or decisions that you make? Uh, well, it's... It is actually, I find it quite uh, tough um, when there are very high expectations. Um, I try to actually tamp down those expectations as, you know, to be possible. In fact, I've gone on record several times as saying that the stock price is higher than we have any right to deserve. Um, uh, and that's for sure true based on, you know, where we are today and have been in the past. So. The stock price obviously ref reflects a lot of optimism about where Tesla will be in the future. Um, and now, the, the thing that makes that um, you know, quite a difficult emotional hardship for me uh, is, is that you know, those expectations sometimes get out of, out of control. And I'm like, I hate disappointing people. Um, and so I'm like trying real hard to meet those expectations, but that's a pretty tall order. Um, and uh, a lot of times it's really not, really not fun, I have to say. A whole lot less fun than it may seem. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't ever sell any stock unless I have to for, for taxes. Um, so, you know, I've said publicly, I'm not going to, like, take money off the table, you know, I'll be last. I'm going down. With, I'm going down with the ship. So uh, I'll be the last to do it. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it's. Oh, I really wouldn't recommend anyone start a car company. <laughs> I really wouldn't recommend <laughs> it. It's not a recipe for happiness and freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Governor Bevan, Governor Hutchinson. <laughs> Mr. Musk, uh, Asa Hutchinson from Arkansas, thank you for your uh, frank observations about uh, exploration. Uh, you know, I look at uh, the spirit of in, uh, invention and the spirit of exploration, which is really the hallmark of America. What is your comment on NASA, its mission? I was in Congress, I supported NASA, but I always feel like it's floundering, does not have the support of the American people that's needed. Uh, what, uh, what's your comment on NASA, its mission, and what advice would you give us? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I should say I'm a big fan of NASA. Um, in fact, at one point, my password was, I love NASA. Uh, <laughs> literally, that was my password. Um, um, and, um, you know, I think the, 
Um, NASA, NASA does a lot of good things for which, people, for which it doesn't get enough credit um, and that the public, I guess, doesn't know that much about. Um, I like a lot, you know, most members of the public, they're not really into hard science, but, you know, it's like not, it's not the, the thing they're tuning in for most of the time. Um, I love hard science, you know, uh, but uh, um, it's not that popular. So, uh, but there's great things in terms of the, the telescopes like the Hubble and the James Webb and the, you know, the rovers on Mars um, and uh, the pro, you know, probes to the outer solar system. Um, those are all like really great things. Um, but to get the public excited, you've got to get people in the picture. Um, it just, it's just a hundred times different if there are people in the picture. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if there's some criticism of NASA, it's like, I, it's like important to remember people in the picture, you know, if you want to get the public support. Um, and, um, but, but like, if, if you talk to a scientist about that, they say, like, well, where's the science in that? Like, you're not getting it. It's like, that's not why people are giving you money. <laughs> it's not, that's, I mean, it's a little bit of the reason, but uh, the, 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 like the, the, the serious scientists are like, people just make things more expensive. Uh, like, why do we have people? I'm like, okay, well, why do we have people at all? <laughs> or anywhere? Um, sometimes the scientists are the ones who just don't, don't understand. Um, even though they're like smart people, but like, you know. Um, so you've got to have something that's going to fire up the, you know, Fire, fire people up and get them really excited. And like, I think if we had a serious goal of having a base on the moon and sending people to Mars um, and said, okay, this is, we're going to be outcome oriented. How are we going to do this? Okay, we've got to change the way contracting is done. Uh, you can't do these like cost plus contracts, cost plus sole source contracts because then the incentive structure is all messed up. So. Uh, as soon as you don't have any competition, well, okay, there's no essential urgency goes away. And as soon as you make something a cost plus contract, you're incenting the contractor to maximize the costs of the program because they get a percentage. So they never want that gravy train to end, and they want to make it, a, it ends a, it, they become cost maximizers. Um, and then you have good people engaged in cost maximization because you just gave them incentive to do that <laughs> and told them they'll get punished if they don't. Essentially, that's what happens. So it's critically important that we change the contracting structure to be a um, competitive commercial bid. Make sure that there are, or, there are always two, at least two entities um, that, that are competing to serve NASA um, and that the contracts are milestone based with, with uh, concrete milestones. PowerPoint presentations do not count. Um, like everything works in PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> Except I have a teleportation device. Look, here's my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so, uh, milestone-based competitive uh, commercial contracts with, with competitors, and then, and then you've got to be prepared to fire one of those competitors if they're not, if they're not cutting it, and, and recompete the rest of the remainder of that contract. And by the way, NASA's actually already done this, and they did it with the, commer with the uh, commercial cargo uh, transportation to the space station. Um, and that was a case where NASA, you know, the NASA actually, I'm, I'm not sure if they thought it would work or not work, but they didn't have the budget to do anything else. So they're like, okay, we're going to try this competitive commercial milestone based contracting, and it worked great. Um, and they awarded it to, uh, to two companies, to, to SpaceX and a company called Kistler. And SpaceX managed to meet, meet the milestones, Kistler did not, so then they, NASA recompeted the remainder of the contract to. Uh, orbital Sciences, but then Orbital Sciences got across the finish line. So now NASA has got two suppliers for uh, taking cargo to the space station, um, and it's a great situation. Same thing for co commercial crew to the space station. NASA competed that. Um, uh, in, 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 the, in the commercial crew case, it's SpaceX and Boeing. Um, and I think that's also a good situation. So now, um, like I can tell you, like the SpaceX team is like, we're going to do this before Boeing. That's for sure. <laughs> and then, like, I bet at the Boeing team, they're like, we're going to do this before SpaceX. Um, that's good. That's a, it's a good forcing function to get things done. But that, I can't tell you how important that contracting structure is. That is night and day. Um, 
there's way too much uh, in, in government which is uh, where it's a sole source uh, cost plus contract. Um, that that just in, again economics 101. Whatever you incent, well, that will happen, and people shouldn't be surprised. It's like oh you just you know said okay if, if that company manages to find some excuse to double the cost of the contract, they're going to get double the profit because they're getting a percentage. So they're going to do, they're going to do exactly that. Um, and, and also, they're not going to say no to requirements. So the government will come up with some set of requirements. 90% of them could make a lot of sense, and 10% of them are cockamamie that double the, the, the price of the, of, the, of, the, of the project. For those 10% of cockamamie <laughs> requirements in a cost plus contract, the contractor will always say yes. There could be a future for you in, in government contracting at the state level. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Governor Hickenlooper and then Governor Ducey. So then, uh, I think like most governors, I, I find it so refreshing to have the unbridled truth. But I do suspect every time you say publicly that the stock price is higher than we have any right to believe, I, I going to guess you probably get some calls from investors suggesting that maybe you don't say that so frequently. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I wanted to go back. And just, just briefly, because I think I, I wrote this down, that you said that uh, artificial intelligence is the, the fundamental existential risk facing civilization. Did I get that close I enough? Think I, in, in my opinion, it is, it is the biggest risk that we face as a civilization is artificial intelligence. And so to a group of leaders, what would you advise that we should, how should we be addressing something that's, that's a, such a large landscape and yet obviously so important? Um, I think that the, you know, one of the roles of government is to ensure the public good, um, it, and, and to uh, that dangers to the, the, the public are addressed. Um, so that hence the regulatory thing. I think the, the first order of business would be to try to learn as much as possible, you know, to understand the nature of the issues, to um, look closely at the progress that is being made um, and the remarkable. Um, Achievements of artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, last year, uh, uh, Go, which is a quite a difficult game to beat, um, that people thought would never be beaten with uh, um, by by a computer. That that, that, a, that a computer would either never beat the best human player, or that it was 20 years away. Um, and last year, um, uh, AlphaGo, which was done by DeepMind, which is a kind of a Google subsidiary, um, absolutely crushed. The world's best player, um, and now, now that now it can crush, it can play the top 50 simultaneously and crush them all. So, just like that pace of progress is remarkable, um, and um, and there's, you can see more and more coming out. I think the robotics, uh, you can see robots that can learn to walk. From, from nothing, um, you know, within hours, like way faster than any biological being. Um, um, but the, the, the thing that's uh, most dangerous is, uh, and, and it's the hardest to kind of wrap, um, kind of get your arms around because it's not a physical thing, is kind of a deep intelligence in the network. Um, he said, well, what harm could a deep intelligence in the network do? So, well, it could start a war um, by, create, by doing fake news and spoofing email accounts and fake press releases and just by, you know, manipulating information. The pen is mightier than the sword. Um, so, uh, I mean, as an example, I want, to be, I want to emphasize, I do not think this actually occurred. This is purely a hypothetical that I do. <laughs> I'm digging my grave here. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, that, like that, there was that second Malaysian airliner that was shot down uh, on the uh, Ukrainian-Russian border. Um, and that, that really amplified tensions between Russia and the, the EU um, in, in a massive way. Well, uh, like, let's say if, if you had uh, an AI that was, uh, wh where the AI's goal was to maximize the value of a portfolio of stocks, um, one of the ways to maximize value would be to 
uh, go uh, long on defense, short on consumer, start a war. Um, and then uh, how could it do that? Well, you know, hacking into the Malaysian Airlines uh, 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 ra aircraft routing server, a route it over a war zone, um, then send an anonymous tip that an enemy uh, aircraft is flying overhead right now. Let's go to Governor Ducey, and then <laughs> we'll have, after Governor Ducey, we'll finish our uh, gubernatorial questions, and then two questions, and then we, quick questions, or one audience question, and then we'll be done. We're, we're running short on time. Governor Ducey. Thanks, Elon. I really enjoyed your comments today. And as someone who has spent a lot of time in his administration trying to reduce and eliminate regulations, uh, I was surprised by your suggestion to bring reg regulations before we know exactly what we're dealing with with mm -hmm. AI. <clears throat> you know, and I've, I've heard the example used uh, if I were to come up with a colorless, odorless, uh, tasteless gas that was explosive, people would say, well, you have to ban that. And, then we'd have no natural gas. So you've given some of these examples of how AI can be an existential threat, but I still don't understand as policymakers what type of regulations beyond slow down, which typically um, policymakers don't get in, in front of entrepreneurs or innovators. Well, I think the first order of business would be to gain insight. Right now, the government does not even have insight. Um, and uh, I think the, the right order of business would be to stand up a regulatory agency, initial goal, gain insight into the status of um, AI activity, um, uh, make sure it, the situation is, is understood. Um, once it is, then put regulations in place to ensure public safety. That's it. Um, and for sure, the companies doing AI will, will most of them, not mine, uh, will squawk and say, hey, uh, this is really going to stifle innovation, blah, 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 it's going to move to China, it won't. Um, and uh, it won't because like, it's like, has, like, has Boeing moved to China? Nope, they're pulling aircraft here. Um, uh, same on, on cars. Um, and so it's not, it's um, the, the notion that if you establish a regulatory regime that companies will just simply move to um, countries with, with lower regulatory requirements is, is false on the face of it because none of them do. And unless it's really overbearing, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about you know, making sure that there is awareness at the government level. Um, I think once there is awareness, people will be extremely afraid, as they should be. All right, one audience question. We'll take the first hand that came up. Or right here. Thanks, Elon. Ina Fried with Axios. Early on in this administration, you had argued pretty vociferously that it was best to engage and better to be in the room than not be in the room. Uh, then when the president decided to pull out of Paris, you said that was kind of the last straw and you were going to drop off. Mm -hmm. What drove you to that? And if you were still speaking to him today, what would you say to the president? Well, I, I thought it was worth uh, doing, you know, trying hard to, um, you know, to, to do what's worth, it was worth trying. I got a lot of flack from, from multiple fronts for even trying. Um, when some guy ran at billboards and like, uh, attacking me and like full page ads in the New York Times and whatnot, um, just, for, just for being on the panel. Um, and, and you know, in every, in every meeting I was like just trying to make the arguments um, in favor of sustainability um, and uh, you know, sometimes other issues like we need to make sure that our immigration laws are not unkind or unreasonable. Um, and uh, you know, did my best, and I, I think in a few cases I did actually make some progress, which gave me uh, some encouragement to continue. Um, but, but then I just really think that the Paris Accord, man, I, I'm, I'm, if I stayed on the councils, then I'd be essentially saying that that wasn't important, but it was super important, um, because I think a country needs to keep its word. 
Um, and you know that that's it's not even a binding agreement. So we could always like slow it down. Um, you know, the, the argument that there would be job losses. Well, we could see if there are job losses before we exit the agreement. And maybe there won't be job losses. Maybe there'll be job gains. Um, but yeah, there's just no way I could stay on after that. <laughs> so you know, did my best. All right. All right, well, everybody, if you would please join me in thanking Elon for being here today. All right. Thank you. Thank you.